Colorado River's water supply. And, and that really, we don't get to uh, make a decision based only on what's best for the ecosystem. We have to make um, decisions that are compromised by water uh, society's need for water supply. So let's kick in with this. Uh, I'm gonna encourage uh, you to ask questions throughout my talk, perhaps uh, by uh, conversing with Matt. And Matt and I have known each other a long time and he can interrupt me at any old time if I'm not making sense. Um, for those of you who are river runners, for those of you who um, live here in the United States, uh, you might be familiar with the name John Wesley Powell, the first uh, explorer of the Colorado River. And in red is the path of his journey of exploration in 1869. Um, just for uh, interest, um, in the 1870 uh, census, San Francisco had a population of 150,000 people. And at the same time, the Transcontinental Railroad was just being constructed across the Western United States and had been completed um, to the railroad crossing of the Green River here at the top and Powell's boats were manufactured in Chicago, dumped off the railroad bridge on the Green River and loaded up and on downstream they want, went. No human being had been on the river through this, no European uh, 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 had been through the river in this area. The confluence of the Green and the Colorado was not known. There were mountain ranges in here that were not known in 1869. At the same time that San Francisco, things were beginning to go strong. Um, let me provide a little bit of background because I do realize that perhaps not everybody is intimately familiar with this geography. This is the watershed of the Colorado River. The exterior rim is the Rocky Mountains, the Southern and Middle Rocky Mountains. Uh, the vast center is the Colorado Plateau, deep canyons, and then the basin and range province with open valleys um, and more distantly separated mountains. And then the Delta at the head of the Gulf of California. The Colorado River is truly an exotic river in the words of geographers. It is a river that carries snow melt or a runoff from distant sources. In this case, the exterior margins of the river in the Rocky, uh, of the basin in the Rocky Mountains. And then that water collects, crosses the Colorado Plateau and then heads on down. The width of these, um, uh, of each unit, each segment of the river here is proportional to the mean annual flow of the river before extensive development. And full on 50% of the uh, runoff that crosses the border here between Utah and Arizona enters a river in the most distant external uh, edges of the drainage network and you can see that the thickness of this line doesn't really change at all downstream from the Utah-Arizona border because there are no significant tri tributaries. This part of the river down here, the lower end was once, has always, it was first called in the early 1900s, America's Nile, because that's what it is. It's just like the Nile River, carrying water from the tropics of Uganda across the deserts of the Sudan and Egypt where no significant water is used and yet the Egyptian civilization is intimately tied to the flux of water that comes from the distant tropics. And in that same way, that is the case 
or a Colorado River that's just an inverted uh, image of that. That's depicted here in the annual hydrographs before substantive river development or construction of Hoover Dam in that the um, hydrograph at Lee's Ferry, at Topak and down at the international border essentially all plot on top of each other, meaning that there were no significant additions to the flow of the river once you came out of the state of Utah. These little deviations here are floods coming out of the Gila River um, uh, that drains the southern um, uh, rim of the Colorado Plateau, but that was really it. So this is the river that you might imagine might be restored. But when we talk about the Colorado River, we cannot only talk about its water. Uh, before the construction of dams, it had the second highest natural sediment supply delivered to the sea of any river system in North America, second only to the Missouri-Mississippi system. Here's the Colorado with the width of these bars proportional to the mean annual sediment flux. So it's a river of water and it's a river of sediment. It's a river that got very warm in summer above 25 degrees C and approached a freezing in the winter, even in Grand Canyon and a highly variable annual flow regime, a high sediment load, a widely varying temperature regime, led to the development of many fish species that live in the Colorado River and nowhere else on earth. An endemic fish species, uh, an endemic fishery of which 75% of the species are, live only in the Colorado River system. And so there is the, are these unique fish species that really adapted to the wildly fluctuating regimes of the Colorado River. The alluvial valleys of the uh, Colorado Plateau uh, were in some cases lined by riparian vegetation and cottonwood gallery forests. The canyons that the Colorado River is famous for uh, had lines of riparian vegetation up at around the elevation of the mean annual flood. And these photos are Powell's boats on the second expedition in 1871. And in the deepest, narrowest canyons, such as in Marble and Grand Canyons, both of which are in Grand Canyon National Park, the river was a stark world of rock, sand, muddy water, um, and not much else. At the same time that Powell was finishing his journey, having come through the Grand Canyon for the first time, the lower end of the river was being uh, transited by side wheel steamboats that were accessing and supplying mining camps along the lower river. The, in, the, interior, the, the interior port was Yuma, and ships would, would come up the Gulf of California, transfer to smaller vessels, bring those supplies through the Delta, offload them to side wheel steamboats, and then go upstream. So the lower part of the river was a navigable river. Those boats that went through the Delta went through what was once one of the most biologically diverse places in North America. Lots of water, lots of vegetation in a hot place. 
The delta of the Colorado River is a big cone of sediment here, which, and that cone of sediment blocks the Gulf of California from invading all of this country that is below sea level. And so in fact, there was a large area here of below sea level land that was blocked and dry because of the delta of the Colorado River here. And it was early recognized that that meant that because this area was lower in elevation than the river itself, if you could route water through some sort of a canal or channel, here an old delta channel, you could use gravity and bring Colorado River water to this arm of the Salton Trough. And water was brought there in 1905 and transformed the arid Salton Trough into the Imperial Valley that it is today. And so the earliest large development on the river was at the furthest downstream point in the river system. That's very important uh, as we move forward. Today, 40 million people use the river and it's both a water supply system and a hydrologic hydro energy system. There are extensive canals that route water out of the Colorado River to Phoenix and Tucson to LA, San Diego, Orange County, Imperial and Coachella Valleys, the Yuma Irrigation District, Central Utah Project, irrigate transbasin diversions to the Colorado Front Range. In winter from November to March, 50% of all, uh, no, excuse me, more than 90% of the leafy green vegetables consumed in the United States and Canada are grown in the Yuma Irrigation District, the Imperial Valley and the Mexicali Valley adjacent in Mexico. So there's a huge dependence on this water supply. A complicated history and politics and legal story exists in deciding how the water is allocated. That involves a mix of international treaties with Mexico, Supreme Court rulings of the US Supreme Court, the Colorado River Compact and the Upper Colorado River Compact, numerous laws, numerous administrative rulings that essentially together is called the law of the river. It's really an intricate accumulation of many of those things. But one of the important aspects of the law of the river is the division of the river into an upper and a lower basin at a point called Lee Ferry, which is near the Utah-Arizona border. And the decision that a fixed amount of water, 75 or 7.5 million acre feet a year of water, must go from the upper basin to the lower basin. And in that sense, the lower basin has a more senior right because it's a fixed amount that must go from the upper basin to the lower basin. The upper basin realized uh, late in the game that if we didn't have enough water to divide the river evenly in half, they might get less than the amount used by the lower basin and therefore their all allocations are based on a proportionate scale. We'll come back to this. But let's just say there's a complicated allocation system that in a sense becomes this simple. We have the upper basin where the water comes from with a few smallish transbasin diversions and the big users down at the lower basin where water is extracted 
and we have Grand Canyon in the middle that I've labeled as the bottleneck. All the water from the upper basin to the lower basin has to go through the Grand Canyon. A complicated infrastructure of dams and diversions has been constructed to facilitate the allocation of the water supply. And that has caused its own suite of environmental problems and issues that are sometimes we try to ameliorate with restoration programs. And I want to distinguish between the impacts of infrastructure, the sheer existence of facilities, in contrast to the effects of operations. And I want to distinguish between the effects of dams and the effects of diversions. Let's talk about the effects of dams first. High dams block fish passage. And some of the native species once cruised around from Wyoming to Yuma over the course of their life history. That no longer can occur first with the completion of Hoover Dam, then with the completion of Lake Powell. Most of these species were extirpated from the lower river only one or uh, only a few are left in the Grand Canyon. A more diverse assemblage of fish exists in the upper basin. I'll come back to this. Dams trap the flux of large organic debris, carbon that fuel the ecosystem. Large dams completely trap the incoming sediment load. And in this uh, sediment budget for the Grand Canyon, I've scaled the arrows by the size of the flux of sediment delivered from upstream in the basin, the Perea River and the Little Colorado River. And the modern sediment supply to the Grand Canyon only comes from these two sources because this enormous arrow of 57 million tons of sand, silt, and clay is now annually deposited in Lake Powell and is completely cut off from the Grand Canyon. Cutting off that supply has led to the erosion of sandbars in the Grand Canyon as depicted in this series of photos that is of interest to river runners it's a distinctive element of the national, of the landscape of the national park. There are cultural and archeological and riparian ecosystem implications of that. <clears throat> the flow regime has been completely changed where water is stored, flood control is implemented, hydroelectricity is produced. And this is the change in the flow regime of the Colorado River through Grand Canyon. From the pre-dam, highly variable spring floods, low flows in winter, to flood control in which you had only a rare flood um, at, uh, once when the system was overwhelmed with water. And most of the time, the river going up and down every day to produce hydroelectricity. We'll talk about some of the changes that occurred after 1990 in a bit. But what's important here is this is the control of water associated with routing that water from the upper basin to the lower basin and making the most of it in terms of water supply and hydroelectricity. We should remember that there are other rivers that are nearly quick completely dewatered. This is the San Rafael River in the Colorado Plateau, an extensively diverted uh, river. You can see this photo match. This summer, in a very dry summer, I actually walked this stream bed in this location for quite a while. The stream was completely dry. 
zero flow in it. And this is a photo match of the Delta today. This is a photo match of that wonderful biologically diverse place. And this is that river today, a river no more, a river fully developed and diverted in the United States and also to supply Mexican irrigation. We should also remember that large reservoirs thermally stratify as well as stratify in terms of salinity. And when reservoirs are full and the withdrawal structures are low, you withdraw water from the hypolimnion of the reservoir and therefore the, the temperature of releases is unusually cold in summer in this river. And that's illustrated in this up and down of the thermal regime of the Colorado River in Grand Canyon before completion of Glen Canyon Dam. And then after it began to fill, the thermal regime began to decrease in its variability. And then when it was full, it was about releases of about nine degrees C. And what's important is these warm temperatures in summer are what's necessary for sexual maturation of many of the native fish. So you, the thermal regime has completely changed the fish, uh, had impacts on the aquatic ecosystem. And this is reflected in this sort of shaded thermal mass, a map, of the Colorado River system in modern times in summer with the blue hues being the uh, cool uh, rivers which are um, unusually cool in summer below Glen Canyon Dam, Flaming Gorge Dam, Navajo Reservoir and the same thing exists on the Gunnison. And the warm conditions only exist uh, in, in, in fewer places. And you can see that overall, the Colorado River and Grand Canyon is in fact artificially cool. So what does that mean? Here's another representation of that same map, except that I, we've highlighted here this little star diagram, which is a status of the fish, or fish communities today. And the top three are the three key native fish. And then you can see that if the bar is empty, it means the fish are not present. And then a little bit of blue means it's rare, a little bit is, is uh, common. And then if it's completely grayed out, that species is extirpated. And the point here is you can see that many of the native fish, the top three fish, we've highlighted those that are extirpated or rare in some sections of the river. So it has not helped the native fishery. Conversely, smallmouth bass and red shiner are undesirable non-native fish that eat or compete with the native fishery. So those guys are bad because they work against the native fishery. And in some cases they do quite well. They've all been introduced into the system and the non-natives really can cause havoc with the native fish. And then rainbow trout is a non-native recreation sport fish that exists in some tailwaters. The reason for showing you all of this is to bring home the point that today's fish community is a novel ecosystem that is a mix of native and non-native species. And we have to deal with that. It's not just so simple that we're restoring anything and if we just restore the flow regime everything will come back wonderfully. We have this mix of native and non-native species. Along with water development, we have a number of programs on the river 
that seek to ameliorate some of the adverse environmental impacts that are going on in different parts of the river system. And we use a number of different mitigation strategies to reverse undesirable conditions. And I've highlighted the, the efforts that we now undertake somewhere in the watershed. And I'd like to highlight that most of what we try to change today are changes in reservoir operations. We don't really try to tackle issues of the existence of the infrastructure itself. And you might say to yourself, well, no surprise, that's a much more controversial thing. I'd also like to point out that some things we do down here, we love to do because we hope that mitigation that doesn't even involve changing the water flow at all will work. Because by gosh, if that can work, that's the least controversial thing to do. So let me go through some of these strategies right now. Um, we implement controlled floods that are very short duration, three-ish to five-ish day long pulses of water that are nothing like the natural flood that would exist. But this simple little pulse of water is intended to stir up sand delivered to the Colorado River from this tributary, the Perea River, that is only 15 miles downstream from Glen Canyon Dam, and then stir up that sand and redistribute it to rebuild those eroding eddy sandbars. It's a program that is reasonably non-controversial. It doesn't affect the big water supply decisions. It leads to an efficient use of the small amount of sand supply that we have. And uh, it does some good uh, and we're quite happy about it. And in 2012, the Obama administration formally adopted a protocol called the High Flow Experiment Protocol in which every year we continuously measure how much sediment comes in from this tributary. If, we, if it's a good year and we get a good amount of sediment that's come in, then we schedule one of those floods. If we don't get a good flash flood season, then that flood doesn't occur because we don't have enough to work with. But it is an important protocol that has had some success. In a blue is the hydro peaking associated pr with production of electricity during the days of the week in the old days. And we have shaved off the magnitude of the fluctuations and now reduce the fluctuations to what we see in green in a way to um, uh, uh, accomplish some benefits to the aquatic ecosystem and reduce some aspects of the processes that actively erode sandbars. But a very interesting new strategy in managing the river is being implemented, where we're completely eliminating any hydro peaking at all on the weekends. For two days a week, the river is held dead steady and therefore, because the river doesn't go up and down, for most of the river, we know the life history of invertebrates, the food supply of the river. And we know that if they lay their eggs at the edge of the water, but then the river goes down due to hydro peaking, those eggs desiccate and die. And therefore, we have depauperate bug populations which mean a depauperate food supply. So in the summer, we hold the river steady on the weekends to provide two days of optimal conditions for bug production. 
and it really has been quite a success. But those sort of manipulations of the daily flow regime, what we now call designer flows, are also affected by that big theme which I introduced to you, which was the big passage of water from the upper basin to the lower basin, the law of the river, all those sort of big picture routing of the water supply. And that big picture routing of the water supply is controlled by what's called the Colorado River Interim Guidelines for Lower Basin Shortages, which controls and sets the rules for when and how much water is routed from Lake Powell to Lake Mead. These are simply uh, graphs of the pro latest projections of the future elevations of, the, um, of those two reservoirs, which I should say, Lake Mead is the largest reservoir in the United States, and Lake Powell is the second largest reservoir in the United States. Now, in some years, um, we the, the way those rules are written, we pass more than the long-term average agreement of the Colorado River Compact. We pass more water through in order to maintain the elevations of Lake Powell. These are called equalization releases. They're called for by that water supply agreement. And when they occur, the regular fluctuations of up and down are replaced by high, relatively steady flows. So we route a lot more water through from Lake Mead to Lake Powell. And as you surely know from all of the education you get at Berkeley and from Matt, more water flow means more sediment transport. Why am I not advancing? There we go. And what happened in this year of high releases in 2011 is that it coincided with a year in which there was no flash flood delivery of sand from the Perea River. In other words, you had lots of water going through the Colorado River mandated by an external agreement and a year of unusually low delivery of sand from the Perea. That's the might be the best thing to maintain the elevation of Lake Mead but the worst thing for maintaining sandbars in Grand Canyon, because you routed all the water through at the worst time of the year in terms of a sand supply. And the net result was to scour away irreversibly and establish a new wave of erosion through the river. We've looked at the different years, the amount of water released, and in this graph in which every year represents the unique combination of releases of water from Lake Powell. This is the source of this water is the Rocky Mountain snowmelt. And on this vertical axis, how much sediment comes in from the Perea River? The source of this is the erosion and the monsoon flood, season floods of the Colorado Plateau. The water and the sediment come from two different places. And when you have lots of water and no sediment, you erode things out. And any number higher than one here is bad for sandbars. And when you have low releases and lots of sediment, you rebuild sandbars. And so what this leads us to is agreements about how to route water through the Grand Canyon. If we have flows at the wrong time, with the wrong sediment supply, we can undo all of the good that we're accomplishing by the controlled floods. And we have learned that. The brave new world is that the climate of Earth is warming. And in the Colorado River Basin, that means less runoff in the system. 
Some parts of Earth are getting more rainfall with climate change, but in the Colorado River system, we're getting less snow, more evaporation, higher snow lines, drier soils, and less runoff. And the projections are that by mid-century, we might have on average numbers like 13 million acre feet of water running off and going through the system. Is that a big number or a small number, 13? Well, right now, current consumptive uses in the Colorado River Basin are a number like 17. If you pretend that the Gila River doesn't exist, then the number might be 15. But when the current use is 15 and the projection is 13, that's not good. That gets people's attention. And that means the water supply might need to be renegotiated. Which leads us to those renegotiations. And a phrase that a friend of mine who used to be Assistant Secretary of Interior said, the law of a river is whatever we say it is. And so the, 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 the water supply agreements are now being renegotiated because they have to be because the supply is declining. And I'm just skipping a description of the details of that. So as we go forward, the challenge before us is when we want to think about the river as a water supply and a power system, how do we also think about it as an ecosystem? And is it possible to resolve the problem in both ways? Right now, I conceived and I lead a project called the Future of the Colorado River Project, which is funded by private foundations and also some money from the USGS. The traditional water su supply issues are resolved by considering watershed runoff, reservoir operations, meeting demands and legal agreements. We're asking as you recut these deals here, what difference does it make to the ecosystem? And even though you're gonna basically make your decisions here, you ought to at least know and anticipate what the implications might be there. So, um, you know, that's to say that message another way, climate change is causing the decline in runoff there will be a political and management response. That in turn will cause changes in flow regime, sediment, temperature, and everything else that will, in, that will affect ecosystems. And we're simply trying to make all of the implications of this cascade to be apparent. We've produced a white paper series on a number of critical topics and the website um, where all of these critical um, white papers that are, we're trying to change the conversation are made available are here. But our job, and this is, um, and Matt, I am wrapping this up. Um, I used to, you know, I've been a professor my whole life, but by the same token, I also ran a federal agency for a couple years I understand the role of academics. I understand the role of government agencies. Um, government agencies can explore radical alternatives uh, much more poorly because they're constrained by all the complexities of our wonderful democracy. My job in academics is to explore the edgier ways that the system might be managed, what we call alternative management paradigms. And if we explore those edgy um, uh, alternatives, if we end up coming up with stuff that's crazy and threatens everybody, then everybody will just say, well, we never heard of Schmidt. And isn't that a crazy idea? Um, but on the other hand, if we come up with some good stuff, then the federal government will reconsider it. And that's what we're doing. We've considered crazy ideas out of the environmental community. 
like preferentially store water in Lake Mead and preferentially drain Lake Powell. We're considering infrastructure alternatives like um, building sediment slurry bypasses to um, uh, augment sediment supplies in Grand Canyon. And there's a whole list of these alternative management paradigms that we're looking at. We've written white papers to try to make transparent to enviro groups and tribes and others exactly how reclamation models and evaluates future alternatives. And we've offered critiques about how to do that better. We've looked at and wrestled with how to think about the unknown future. This is where we are now. We've been in an extreme drought since 2000. We, this lo slightly lower condition is causing great problems in the watershed. What we don't know is whether these drought conditions are the new normal or whether even in the future, ongoing climate change will make the basin even more arid. And so we are exploring different alternatives for what that future hydrology might be. And in a recent white paper, we've offered these as utterly reasonable, historically based, utterly possible stresses on the system. Mean annual flows of less than 13 million acre feet that might last for 20 to 25 years. Remember, current use in the river, 15 million. These are big issues that have to be dealt with. We've asked ourselves whether the projections of future water use are really inevitable. And this will come, this will be um, of interest to many of you these are projections by the Bureau of Reclamation or the Upper Colorado River Commission of the growth of water consumption. And in black is the actual use. No surprise to all of us, actual use is always less than the projections. So we're looking at what the system might be like if we never have any growth, because we think it's possible. And I think that I just want to say here, that we are looking at forbidden topics. What if there's no more growth in the upper basin? What if the lower basin increases its shortages? In a long projected drought, how much, at what point is the system sustainable? And we look at those patterns and we look at different caps and we're trying to identify what is a sustainable system. And of course, all of that means different amounts of water stored in Lake Powell and different amounts of water stored in Lake Mead, which means the temperature of releases would be different. And in this paper, which is just being released by ecological applications in the next day or two, we project what the thermal regime in Grand Canyon would be if we release water persistently from a lower Lake Powell and we project that, late, that the Grand Canyon's waters would be much warmer. And we identify that that helps some aspects of the native and non-native fishery, and it hurts others. And in fact, whether we have drought or whether we preferentially store water in Lake Powell or Lake Mead, it helps some aspects of the aquatic ecosystem and hurts others. And when you remember that the Colorado River system is a novel ecosystem in which we've completely changed it for forever, there's a challenge to us to say, well, which do we want? Do we want the left side? Do we want the right side? Which is where I end. As Matt has told you, in restoration, if you don't know where you're going, you'll never know whether you got there. And in places like the Colorado River, we love to set objectives for the environmental conditions that are all over the map. These are all the desired future conditions for the Grand Colorado River and Grand Canyon. 
and I've highlighted in red every desired condition, which is essentially a relic of the past. And I've highlighted in green every attribute that's a relic of because we have dams. And we've said, guys, you can't have it all. You gotta decide which of these you want. You've gotta have it simpler. Right now we have, we do not have a clear objective for what we want in different parts of the river. And therefore we don't really know where we're going. Colorado River's a water supply and it's a river ecosystem. Climate change is giving us a declining watershed runoff. Decisions about how to manage and allocate the future water supply have the potential to change river ecosystems. I've illustrated through temperature, I could do the same with sediment or flow regime. Restoring the river to pre-disturbance conditions is flat out impossible. We're only gonna get to rehabilitate and mitigate things and any decision to do that is going to be the result of a complex suite of decisions about how you allocate the water supply, what goals we're chasing after, where to store the water, and if you want to implement any mitigating infrastructure. I've used examples from Grand Canyon and the Upper Basin. I could tell you the same story for the Colorado River Delta in Mexico. Matt could tell you the same story for the Lower River. It's complicated, but we have to work in conjunction with the water supply community, in conjunction with everybody else who cares about the river. That's where we're at. Thanks, Jack. That was uh, amazing. Great talk. So we're um, open for questions. We have... Um, about to eight or 10 minutes. And looks like Albert, um, are you ready to chime in? Oh, I or, was, you were just, you were just clap, clapping there. I was there, clapping, right? but I could okay. ask it. But... <laughs> okay, fire away. Okay, yeah, so um, really interesting um, stuff. I really enjoyed this overview of everything that has happened in the Colorado. Um, so my question is on how optimistic are you? You have seen probably the demise and comeback of the system. Um, and particularly, do you think that um, we may be able to move from these uh, one-time experiments like Mini 319 uh, to something like restoring the regime rather than individual events? And maybe even going beyond the, the flow regime and restoring the thermal regime. The technology is certainly there in Flaming Words. There's this TCD. So how optimistic are you? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so um, I am very optimistic about the opportunities in much of the Colorado River Basin. If I want to show someone why to be pessimistic and demoralized, I take them to the Rio Grande. Yeah. And that's because the single biggest control on having optimism or pessimism is the basic geography of where is water used and extracted. And the thing that gives the Colorado River hope, but not the Delta, but not the Delta, is the fact that the biggest, most senior users are the state of California, the All-American Canal and the Imperial Valley, and then the political influence of Arizona, huge water users. What that does is it guarantees that a whole lot of water comes through Grand Canyon. I never once said that Grand Canyon had a problem with water. Grand Canyon is more water than it knows what to do with. Conversely, in the Rio Grande, you take 50% of the water out in the state of Colorado and almost none gets through. So if we jump to the, so, I'm very optimistic about the Colorado River all the way through the Grand Canyon. Between Hoover Dam and Yuma, look, it's just a, it's just a make-believe river of a channelized river. It's degraded. You pump water up on the floodplains. 
Matt is an expert in that. It, it, there's no hope to make that a natural river again. And then in the Delta, the Delta is a destroyed ecosystem. There is no nice way to say it. We destroyed the most biologically diverse place in North America. We took the flow to zero. What we're doing with the pulse flow is, recreate, is creating something that was never there, a riparian vegetation community. How do we, um, this is a monumental ask in the future. I think that what we learned from the minute 319 pulse flow is that it does not make any sense to release water as a pulse. It just seeps into the ground. But we can establish artificial irrigated areas of native vegetation. And I do think that is possible. It's extremely hard to recreate that wonderful image of the Mexican city of San Luis out celebrating. The, I was there. I, I was part of the administration team that was part of that whole pro. It's the most glorious thing I've ever participated in. Getting that back is enormously hard. And I am not optimistic of that. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see, on that cheery note, we uh, <laughs> do have a uh, couple of questions from the Vimeo chat. And uh, Bruce Orr asks, what are the biggest drivers in the renegotiation of water supply and law of the river? Who has the most weight in the negotiations? What sort of partnerships should the environmental advocates lobby or partner with to help achieve more balanced objectives? Well, as Bruce knows, hello, Bruce. Um, make no mistake about it. Who has the most, uh, who has the most say at the table? The seven basin states. Make no mistake about it. The seven basin states and the federal government are the big players. Um, municipalities have an increasingly important role and because virtually every city is doing a one, cities are the big innovators. Cities keep using less water. And so um, cities are a big innovative influence. Um, state of Colorado is a huge player. State of California is a big player. State of Arizona is a big player. Um, uh, hydropower understands that it's a declining resource. And I think that hydropower really doesn't matter very much in these negotiations. One of the most wonderful things is the growing influence of the tribes. The tribes are working hard to get a seat at the table. They were completely excluded the last time around. And the tribes are being empowered by a number of groups. And the tribes are trying to get better legal control in which they might market water. There are many enviro groups funded by some major foundations they have some influence. It's not clear to me that they're radically going to change the conversation, but there are some other smaller environmental groups that have wonderfully innovative ideas, and I'm trying to give some of those smaller groups voice. But at the end of the day, the decision of how to go forward will be made by the state governments. In that sense, the world has not changed. And everything that me and everybody else is doing is to try to create pressure on that small group. All right. um, we have one more question here from uh, Eric Altena. With respect to the Grand Canyon, he asked how significant is Clearwater discharge within the annual sediment budget, i.e. despite efforts to, and flow alterations 
are we still figuring out the common problem of sediment sinks in the large reservoirs? Absolutely. The, the, one of the things that we've really learned over the decades of research is back when I started in the 80s, we were completely focused on the adverse effects of hydropower peaking, right? And, and those waves as being the cause of erosion. That's a small inconvenience. That's a small issue. The fundamental problem is the fact that 57 million tons of fine sediment are being caught in Lake Powell. Make no mistake about it. That is the culprit. And one of the biggest intellectual shifts that has occurred in the last decade or so is understanding that the fundamental problem is, in fact, sediment deficit. Um, being a big sediment deficit guy, I think that's a strong note to end on. <laughs> Jack, thank you. That was uh, really fantastic. Um, we appreciate it. And um, I imagine many of us will never look at the Colorado River again in the same way. So, Matt, uh, thanks. It. I'm going to stay on uh, for a half an hour. I've got to go in about a half an hour, but I, I look forward to listening to... Uh, a bit of uh, the student talks, and then I will quietly um, uh, step away. But uh, good for you, and you've got a great mentor in Matt, and uh, thanks for letting me participate. Thanks, Jack.